manner. Visit Manor Entertainment's official website and social media. Our official website is manorhq.com. Follow us on Twitter at Official Manor. We're on Instagram at Manor Entertainment. And our YouTube channel is listed under Manor Entertainment, where you'll find many of our features currently playing. Again, visit our website, manorhq.com. Follow us on Twitter at Official Manor. Follow us on Instagram at Manor Entertainment and subscribe to our YouTube channel listed under Manor Entertainment. As always, share with others and spread the word. Have you subscribed to Manor Post? Receive the latest news and updates when Manor Entertainment's weekly newsletter is delivered to your email every Saturday. A subscription is free and takes less than 30 seconds to sign up. Go to manorhq.com and fill out the form on the homepage. Join the rapid growing list of Manor Post subscribers by requesting your weekly delivery today. Sign up at manorhq.com. That's manorhq.com. So you have something to sell in the horror genre market. Maybe it's your novel, or maybe it's your artwork, or maybe it's your podcast. Whatever horror genre product or service you have, you can reach your target audience by becoming a Manor Entertainment sponsor. It's both easy and affordable. The current rates are the lowest they'll ever be, but they won't remain that low forever. Get started today by sending an email to contact at manorhq.com for more information. Become a Manor Entertainment sponsor today. Email contact at manorhq.com. Warning. The following program may contain violence, explicit language, sexual situations, and dark content, unsuitable for some listeners. It is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. Presented in Cinematic Audio.
Alrighty, it's Bird, it's Plane, he's insane, it's Superman. First caller, hello. Hello, can you hear me? That's who it is. Good. There was a horrendous smell coming from the neighbor's apartment across the hall from Doug and Julie's. The smell often made them gag, and Doug definitely thought it was dangerous to Julie and their unborn child. Julie was eight months pregnant, and it had not been a smooth pregnancy, with several bouts of hospitalization with anemia. If Doug's family and friends thought him overprotective, well, they could just stick it. Two years before, Julie had lost a child. It nearly ruined their marriage. Doug blamed himself for working too much, spending too many hours at the power plant. Julie slipped off into a deep depression that lasted six months. Eventually, a therapist named Dr. Gilly Kiffin helped the young couple through their crisis. When Kiffin expressed concern over the couple having another child so soon, Doug fired him. Then he harassed Doug. He said Doug owed him for the work he did. Doug had given Kiffin nearly $3,000 in fees. Kiffin sounded crazed. Doug was in fear for his and Julie's lives. Doug moved Julie 20 miles away to ensure Kiffin had no contact with her at all, quitting his job at the power plant and took another as an assistant manager at Bluebird's all-night pancake house. He sold their house to a Mexican contractor as a safe haven for illegal immigrant workers the contractor smuggled in. They took up residence in the small two-bedroom apartment on the Lower East Side of the town of Belmont, once a port for many pirates coming and going in the Atlantic Ocean. Doug laid on the couch with his arm around Julie, she lying on top of him, her head on his chest. I wish we could go back to the old life. You know that's not possible, Jules. We can't let him near you again. He'll destroy us. I know, but is he as dangerous as you say, Doug? Why hasn't anyone done anything to take his license away? I just don't understand how he was- Shh, let me worry, honey. You have the child to think of. Julie raised her head slightly, looking at Doug perplexed. She opened her mouth to say something, but decided not to pour fuel on the fire. What? Nothing. She leveled her head back on his chest. You smell that? It's putrid, God. I've been smelling it the past two days. <coughs> I thought it was the pregnancy making me smell things. No, honey, it's not you, definitely. He stood, went to the door, and peeked out the hole. Who lives there? Never seen anybody come and go. I saw this strange older man leaving yesterday. That's the only movement I've seen over there. Hmm. That smell. I'm going to call the office on this. No, Doug. No trouble, please. It might be something else and not... Honey, come on. You know better than that. Well, if he comes... You wouldn't believe this. He motioned for Julie to come over. She struggled to rise from the couch for a minute or two, moving from side to side, finally getting to her feet. She waddled over a hand on her corpulent belly. He helped Julie step closer to the door. She bent down and looked through the peephole. A small older man was pulling a brown stained cabinet up one flight of stairs. He only had three steps to go to get to the apartment across the hall. It looked as if he had super strength. He didn't struggle at all with the long, angular contraption. Its two doors must have been latched because the way he was pulling the cabinet, they would have been swinging side to side. <laughs> How in the hell is he getting up those stairs? He's so small. He must be a dwarf of some kind. Doug drew closer to her and whispered in Julie's ear. <laughs> <laughs> The small man jingled a set of keys, several it looked like, found the right one and didn't hesitate to force it into the double bolt on his door. The door creaked open without the touch of his hand upon the doorknob. Julie shot a glance at Doug, eyes wide, her mouth parted slightly. What? He... he just opened that door. 
He didn't touch the doorknob. Bullshit. You, you always imagine. No, Douglas. I know what I saw. Okay. Okay. There was a look between each other before Julie went to the peephole again. He's leaving again. I wonder what he drives. Doug rushed to the window. He saw the small man amble out of the building and stop in the middle of the parking lot. He looked skyward toward the east. In the blink of an eye, the small man was gone. What the hell? Doug took an uneasy step back. What is it, Doug? Julie ran to his side. Julie helped Doug to the couch and eased him down. I'll never dispute another word you say, honey. He, he just he disappeared. I told you he was odd. All right, all right already. Weird crap, for sure. Let's try to forget about it. We shouldn't have been spying on him anyways. What the hell? Oh, oh, Doug, dear, what is it? You don't smell that? Not so much, no. Jeez, I was sleeping well. Do you know how many damn nights I haven't been able to sleep like that? <sighs> well, go back to sleep then. I would if some jerk wouldn't keep me up. All right, all right already. You can go back to sleep. I'll go watch TV. If you weren't so selfish. I said I was going in the other room. Just drop it, will ya? Don't smoke in the apartment. I can smell it. I don't do that. You smoke in the bathroom like you were in school or something. I can smell it. Doug stopped himself. He sighed and opened the bedroom door to apologize. Julie was fast asleep again. Doug shut the door gingerly, trying to keep the squeaking to a minimum. He heard the door to the other apartment slam shut. Doug was curious. He looked through the peephole. He saw the small man standing in the hallway, his hand on his chin. Then he quickly opened his apartment door and walked in, and stood there for a few moments. The small man hurriedly shut the door behind himself and trotted down the stairs. Doug noticed the door was slightly ajar. He was curious about the strange little man. Who was he? Why was he leaving so much? Mainly, how was he able to disappear like he did? <sighs> Can you help me, Doc? Doug said pacing up and down the red-carpeted office of Dr. Gilly Kiffin. Kiffin was a short, round man with a long, scatter-gray beard and thinning red hair. He sat there in his black leather chair, his unusually large hands resting under his chin. Well, can you help me out? Sit down, please, Mr. Pratchett. Doug stopped in his tracks took two long strides and fell into a velvet plastic chair. Kiffin sighed. He picked up a pencil and jotted something down on his notepad. How did you find me, Mr. Pratchett? Dolores. Dolores Gilmore suggested you. Is that the woman you were having an affair with? Doug nodded. She's a student of mine here at the university. She's apparently told you about my studies into mind control. I was once contacted by Simon Fuller, the debunker of all things paranormal. He claimed he defrocked me of my cult status. Did you hear about that? No. I've never heard of you before, Dolores. Doug started to rise, and Kiffin motioned with a hand to stay seated. Then how do you know I'm not a fraud? Kiffin leaned back in his leather chair, arms resting behind his head. She showed me a tape of you at the mall. 
The things you were able to get people to do, it was amazing. No, Mr. Pratchett. They were willing to be led a certain path of thought. So let me get this straight. You want me to cloud your wife's memories of your affair. <laughs> Affairs, Dr. Kiffin. Tell her you are a marriage counselor. I've hired you to help our marriage. Help us move on with our life. Kiffin sat there quietly, eyeing Doug, possibly scrutinizing him. Doug wasn't sure. He wasn't sure any of this would even work on Julie. The only thing he knew for sure was that he didn't like Kiffin at all. He didn't like the arrogant way he presented himself, or the way he used his vocabulary to belittle people as he'd witness on the videotape Dolores had him watch. Okay. Five thousand dollars. Read the contract carefully, if there is any reason you can't make your payment in full. We shall have to come to some terms in other means. Perhaps forfeit something else you may own. Doug snatched a pen from Kiffin's desk. He tossed the pen down and locked eyes with Kiffin. Don't worry. I can make the payment. My job can't function without me. Doug was cooking hamburgers on the George Foreman and he didn't like being interrupted when he was cooking. It was just one of many pet peeves he had, along with unwashed dishes in the sink and clutter in a bathroom and trash left in the car. He was already miffed at Julie for getting upset with him being gone all night and part of the day, and missing work. She told him he would lose his job, and that would be two in one year. Oh, how cruel to bring that up. She was asleep finally. Putting up with a hormonal pregnant woman is the equivalent of going through emotional water torture. The rapid-fire rapping at the door continued. Doug rushed to answer it, wiping his hand with a dish towel to suck up the juices from tomato and onion he had just chopped. Doug looked through the peephole. It was the small man from next door. He was dressed in all black. Black three-piece suit, black Homburg, and a short black cape. He was wearing a monocle on his left eye, and his neatly trimmed beard had some sort of hair product smoothed in. Oh, shit. Does he know I was in his apartment last night? Doug opened the door slightly and peered out suspiciously. Yes? Good evening! I very much would like to meet you and your beautiful wife, Mr. Pratchett. May I come in? It was a sickening smile, though it was a smile, and most likely a smile from someone who rarely did so. Doug sighed. After all... They'd been aware of the man for weeks and had spied on him. Doug had even entered the man's place of living without being invited. It was the least he could do. Sure. He shook his hand as the man strode in, as if he were walking on thin air. I'm Doug Pratchett, but you already know that. How? <laughs> My name is Henry Gamal. Where is your beautiful wife? Gamul looked around. Tiny black eyes danced feverishly. She's asleep, Mr. Gamul. How did you know my name? Oh, the office told me once I inquired. <laughs> he closed his eyes and drew in a long breath as he touched the couch sensuously. His little fat fingers caressed the fabric softly. Hmm. This is where the child was conceived. Shocked, Doug stood there, fists drawn together. His face turned sour, his nose wrinkled up. What did you just say? I'm very sorry, Mr. Pratchett. It was my feeble attempt at humor. Seeing as your wife is with child, I greatly apologize. I'm not very good at social gatherings. I've always been an outsider. Please, forgive me. It sounded genuine. Doug could see the difficulties Gamal might have throughout his life. It's okay, Mr. Gamal. 
What exactly did you want? Like I said, I wanted to meet you and Julie. Invite you over for dinner. I'm afraid we're already having dinner, Mr. Gamol. Well, maybe drinks later. I'm afraid not. Please, Mr. Pratchett. I am trying very hard here. My doctor stated and advised that I put myself out there, as he had said, to meet people, socialize. He said before I die, I need to do this, so on my deathbed, I shall have fewer regrets. If we're going to do this, Mr. Gamal, then we need to be on a first-name basis, as if we already knew each other. Gamal showed that sickening smile again. He took Doug's hand and patted it. It means so much to me, Doug. Everyone calls me Henry. Shall we say eight o'clock? Doug gently removed his hand. I'll tell Julie. Thank you. Gamul opened the door and stepped into the hallway. Henry. Yes, Doug. Now, a sinister smile crossed Gamul's pockmarked face. It froze Doug inside. What's that horrible smell coming from your apartment? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Doug. I don't smell anything. See you at eight. Gamul waved a hand as he went inside his apartment. Julie entered the room, stretching and yawning in her slip. Her hair was a mess, tangled in a bun she'd fixed earlier. Doug closed the door and glanced at her. Her hands fell to her prominent belly. Oh. Who was that? That was the man next door, honey. Henry Gamol. Doug was inside the apartment next door. A strange, beautiful voice lured him inside. He had that urge to find that voice, that lifting, haunting voice that sang in an undeniable language. No language Doug had definitely heard of. He wandered in. Only a lamp with a soft, warm glow lit the place. Still hearing the voice singing as if it were calling out to him, he passed by antiques, expensive cream-colored furniture, and not one modern appliance about the place. Not even a house phone. The soft voice was echoing ever so slightly, bringing Doug ever closer and his gliding feet never touched the floor. When he found the voice, he found the cabinet that Gamul was dragging upstairs. The cabinet seemed to breathe. The wood panels moved up and down as if it were alive with lungs and a pounding heartbeat. Doug touched the panels. They were as soft as silky skin. And in his mind, he heard a thousand sighs of orgasms. Doug felt a deep emotional shock in his nether regions. More than just a jolt, something stirred down there that pushed against his pajamas. Come to me. He heard the woman's voice in his mind, and his heart skipped a beat. Where? Doug peeked inside the glass doors. Here, inside the cabinet. Doug caught a glimpse of a beautiful face. Large brown eyes, thin ruby lips, and a small pert nose. Doug smiled, feeling slightly woozy. Who are you? I am Lyra. Come to me. The cabinet's glass doors opened. A swirling, maneuvering mist surrounded Doug, without even thinking about it. It was almost as if a hand grabbed him and pulled Doug inside the cabinet. Darkness fell upon his eyes at first. Then a bright, piercing light shattered the darkness. A woman with bright red hair stood naked before Doug, sparks of light illuminating ample portions of her body that Doug more than approved of. Come. She opened her arms to caress him. Instead, she enveloped him. She was warm, and Doug felt all of his worries being buried under a blanket of love. In here, 
The outside world has never existed. Doug closed his eyes and let himself do what came natural. From beautiful lovemaking to animal sexual deviancy, anything went. More wine? Gamul offered the bottle to Doug. Doug declined, waving a hand. How are you, my darling? Can I get you anything? I'm fine, Henry. You sure have led a colorful life. Gamul was seated next to her and kept placing a hand on her knee whenever he launched into a story. She would have taken offense if she wasn't convinced he was gay. How was New York in the early 60s? Parties with Truman Capote? Doug said from a chair he knew had to be Louis XIV's era. Oh, true. Was a lovely person. He wasn't confident. As a human being, as a writer, that was different. He knew he had talent. I helped him in so many ways. <sighs> I need to use the bathroom. Julie struggled off the sofa. Gamal rose and helped her up. Through the bedroom, darling. First door on the left. Gamal pointed and smiled sheepishly. He waited for her to leave the room and then turned to Doug. Such a beautiful woman, Doug. Oh, you are so blessed. Yeah. Doug forced a smile. I don't need reminded of how much of a turd I am. Very blessed. I know the baby will be smart and a beautiful child. Gamul had tears streaming down his cheeks. Doug was uncomfortable. How strange for someone to act, especially for people who hardly knew each other. Oh my, how beautiful. Oh no, the fucking cabinet. <laughs> Gamul rose from his seat and dashed into the bedroom. Doug followed at a safe distance, knowing exactly what she was talking about. By the time Doug reached the bedroom, Julie's face was buried in Gamul's bedroom wall. With him patting her on the back, she was sobbing loudly, shaking her head at Gamul, whispering back. Doug stood in the doorway, distressed and confused. What happened? Julie has suffered a terrible shock. Oh God, I swear I saw it. I saw it, I saw that thing with horns and fangs. Red skin, I swear it. I don't doubt you, darling. Sometimes when we are stressed, our minds can play tricks on us. I've heard that before. How strange. Why does that sound familiar? Suddenly, Julie pushed past Camul and ran to Doug. She hid her face in his chest, hiccuping sobs now. Take me, please. I never want to set foot in here again. Doug smiled at Camul, who held his hand over his mouth, shocked at the decision made by Julie. Doug put his arm around Julie and helped her to the front door. Gamul trotted behind them. But we were having such a good time. Please, don't leave. Doug opened the door to his apartment. He ushered Julie inside, slamming it hard. Gamul was left at his door, fuming. A small vapor of steam rose from the doorknob and drifted in the air. Inside the cabinet, blue swirls of landscape changed from beach to mountain as Doug and Lyra walked hand in hand. She sat down as soon as the landscape became a blue meadow with soft orange daisies underneath them. Lyra pulled him to her and Doug fell on top of her. Their laughter echoed throughout the bright purple sunset background. He kissed her, brushing strands of hair out of her eyes. I want you to stay with me forever. There was a gleam in her eyes. He wanted to kiss her again, but the memory of Julie kept haunting him. I can't. Why? You don't understand. I, I've got responsibilities. People depend on me. Like her? Yeah. Her. I make you happy, not her. Lyra pushed Doug off of her. She stood and trotted a few feet from him. She glanced at him. 
You only come to me on your terms. Not anymore. If you want me, you come to me and stay. Forever. Lyra ran to the top of a tall hill of blue mountain terrain and jumped off. Doug hung his head. He already knew he'd made a mistake. Why were you in Henry's apartment? Julie was waiting at the door for him. He asked me to look in and make sure the cable guy showed up. I don't think that's true, Doug. Julie folded her arms and tapped her left foot. That was something she always did when she was miffed. Henry is too eccentric for TV. You smell. Oh no, it's happened. She put her face in her hands and started to sob loudly. It was always a terrible, painful weeping that came from Julie. The kind that always made Doug sorry for the things he'd done to cause them. Again? I thought I was just being jealous. All those hazy dreams. They were true. Doug sighed. He leaned against the door, defeated. Julie looked up. Tears drained rapidly from her flushed cheeks. Don't you have anything to say for yourself? Doug tried, but nothing came. Get out. You don't care about me or the baby. Doug tried to retort, but nothing would come from his clouded mind. Instead, all he heard was a faint female voice singing so beautifully he could barely contain his smile. Julie was horrified. Get out! Get out, you motherfucker! Doug kept smiling, the enchanting female voice still in his mind. He shrugged, nodded at Julie, and opened the door to slither out. Doug entered the cabinet, feeling things were not quite right. The landscape was all deep reds and the sky was swirls of black and gray. It was no longer warm inside the cabinet, but ice cold. Yes, it felt completely different. But he kept calling for Lyra. He searched as the terrain changed under his feet from sand to rock to grass. Finally, something he'd never seen inside the cabinet. Pavement. Where are you? I'm here to stay. Forever. Without warning, a long misshapen hand reached out from the shadows and took hold of Doug by the nape of his neck. Doug's screams echoed throughout a landscape of infinite nothingness. The creature sat on his back and tore flesh from the back of Doug's head. Doug screamed again. He prayed this ordeal would end soon, but he had no idea it was to last an eternity. His flesh being shredded by a demon whose eyes glowed red, and that would be the only light source in that world. Lyra stood on a mountainside and sang in a beautiful, seductive tone. One month later. <gasps> Gamul and Kiffin were in Gamul's bedroom, holding hands. Julie was on Gamul's bed going through her third hour of labor. A hooded woman spoke incantations, while a dwarf with glowing red eyes burned incense and repeated the hooded woman's words. Are you happy, my love? Indubitably. Just think, Henry, our first child.
You've been listening to Manor House, Episode 29, The Cabinet of Henry Gamal, presented in cinematic audio. Subscribe to this show and leave a rating, a review, and general feedback wherever you're receiving this program. Share with others on social media and at home. Your feedback, as well as sharing with others, helps grow and continue future productions. Credits. This episode was originally recorded and produced in 2016. Performances by Atticus Jackson as Doug Pratchett, Tisha Boone as Julie Pratchett, Rock Capuano as Henry Gamal, Morgan Montague as Gilly Kiffin, Nicole Doolin as Lyra, Christopher Ford as narrator, story by Mark Slade, directed, produced, edited, and scripted by Rock Capuano, audio and sound design provided by Etel SFX, music by Kogue, Doxent Ziegmold, Miu, Claude Debussy, additional music by DL Sounds, theme song by Alan Postscript, based on The Shining by The Angelas, cover art by Nathalie Ziegler. Manor House was created by Rock Capuano. Manor House is a Manor Entertainment production. The story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in this production are fictitious. No identification with actual persons, living or deceased, places, buildings, and products is intended or should be inferred. This production is property of Manor Entertainment, LLC. No portion of this production may be reproduced or used by any means without the proper written consent of Manor Entertainment, LLC. This production is protected under the copyright laws of the United States and other countries throughout the world. Country of first publication, United States of America. Any unauthorized exhibition, distribution, or copying of this production, or any part thereof, may result in civil liability and criminal prosecution. Copyright 2019, Manor Entertainment, LLC. Manor.